got this introduction. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. I'd like to welcome Tracy Miller from um, Roger Sturck and Harbour Architects. Um, the partnership has over had, had over three decades of, um, of practice now, and it's attracted many uh, awards, um, great designs, two RIBA Sterling prizes for the um, T4 Terminal 4 Terminal um, in Madrid, uh, and Maggie's in London in 2009. Uh, the company is chaired still by Richard Rogers, um, who's a Pritzker Award winner, RIBA gold medal, pretty much everything you can put your hands on. Um, the company uh, has changed, though, to acknowledge the input by its, its partners and its, its team, most notably Graham Sturck and Ivan Harbour. Um, and this is to suggest, I think, that the practice will continue to go on. Um, these two young partners will, will have a big say in the future. Uh, Tracy is an associate partner alongside 10 others in a firm of 200. Uh, the office operates a think ta tank philosophy, so they all work together um, every week. Um, Tracy has been um, a judge for the Best Architects in 2007, um, and along with Ivan Harbour, she has hosted a talk at the Royal Academy suggesting why you should pursue architecture, why she pursued architecture, and why you'd be crazy not to. Um, uh, went here uh, in the same class as Nick, um, and without any further ado, please take the stage. Thank you. It's very nice to be back. Um, I seem to recall the thing about the search theatre is it's incredibly uncomfortable. It's absolutely beautiful, but very uncomfortable, so I'll, I won't talk for too long. Um, so, yes... Tracy Bella. I went to college here. I did my degree here. Well, I didn't come back for diploma. Um, although I would have loved to have come back, but circumstances took me elsewhere. And um, I joined um, Rogers in 2000, so sort of a year after diploma. So in reality, I've been there for the majority of my working career, if you like. That's me. <laughs> I had aspirations to be an architect long before I started studying it. I think that's about age five or something on the site of the uh, Sainsbury's Centre. So, uh, good place to start. Um, I'm going to talk today about the core principles of the practice, and then a little bit about some projects that I've worked on that have been very different experiences for me in terms of side projects, the people, um, the partners leading them, and my experience on them. And then, if I don't run out of time, which I should keep a note of, um, I will try and uh, leave you with some what might be coming next, our newest project, which is the London School of Economics that we uh, recently won. So, when I joined the practice back in 2000, it was the Richard Rogers partnership, um, primarily Richard. I'm sure you're all familiar with Richard. He's a larger-than-life character, extremely colourful, even more colourful on that display than on my one, um, <laughs> positively neon. Um, but it's not just him, and it never was just him. At the point at which I joined, that was the partnership structure, which... For me, it was a great time to join the practice because it was a very transitional point. Um, at that point, many of the partners who were the founding partners were still there. You've got some real famous characters in that lot. You've got uh, John Young, who's famous for his detailing, his high-tech, uh, one of the key prop uh, proponents of the kind of high-tech architecture. Uh, Mike Davis, who, Mr. Red, has been wearing red since 1974. <laughs> um, I asked him why he wore red, and he said because he stopped wearing purple, apparently. <laughs> and never really offered any more justification than that. He wore purple through the 60s and then changed to red. So there you go. Uh, Marco Goldschmidt in the black T-shirt, who was the kind of the business brain to the company. And standing on the right of him, uh, Laurie Abbott, who kind of designed genius. Um, a lot of the amazing uh, core ideas and the projects that you'll all know, a lot of the thinking came from Laurie, a very quiet, mild-mannered character, but... Just an amazing kind of insight into design. And the two younger partners there, Ivan and Graham, Graham leaning down the front, Ivan at the far right, um, who, of course, as of 2005, the practice was renamed Rogers, Sturck, Harbour and Partners, possibly in that process throwing away one of the best-known architectural brands of RRP. Um, 
but it was renamed to reflect the increasing influence and sort of design direction of the two youngest partners, Graham and Ivan, who had both been there, had joined the practice in the 80s, I think. Um, so kind of cut their teeth in the practice and now very much do lead the design and the practice. Richard is still very involved. Less of those original partners are around. So there's a handful around still. Um, Richard's in most days and still kind of continues to be our figurehead and our kind of social and political conscience. But a lot of the design work now comes from Ivan and Graham. But there are six core principles of the practice, which are city and context, public realm, legibility, flexibility, energy, and the team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where these came from. They're principles that are inherent in the work right from the very first projects, although I'm sure no one actually wrote them down as six principles at that point. Um, but right back from the early days, the first kind of well-known project that the office did, which was, of course, Renzo and Richard, won this competition. They couldn't believe they won it. Uh, but it was really, it was a sort of trailblazer in the language that has gone on to sort of define the practice. This idea of legibility, of a building where you can read the component parts, you know what it's doing, any bit of it, whether it's a piece of service or a piece of structure. The colour coding, it's interesting facts about these projects, these famous projects. The colour coding of the services on the back elevation there is the French colour coding for technical drawings. So water, electricity, they are the colours that French um, technical drawings are coded by. And of course the structure, which was all brought to the outside of the building to create big, clear span, flexible exhibition space so that this building could reinvent itself with each iteration of its life and each exhibition that came in. So you start to see these ideas coming in. And of course one of the biggest things about this project, that the reason they won it, was that they were the only entry from whatever it was, 2,000 competition entries that gave up half the site, made the building higher, broke the official 25 metre boundary or whatever it was for this part of Paris, in order to give up half the site to create a new public square. And this is again at the very core of our architecture, that it isn't just about the buildings, it's about the setting and about giving something back to the city and creating a place as well as a building. And I think these Themes were they explored further after the Pompidou Centre. You've probably a few of you have seen the um, Brits that built modern Britain. There's a series on at the moment, and they've been talking about how after the Pompidou Centre, no one would give them any work uh, because it was such a groundbreaking building. And uh, I think, uh, even though it was very, very much acclaimed in France, I think the British public were a bit more wary about this idea of this kind of inside-out architecture. But Lloyds were very brave, and they gave this commission, or they won this competition, to build the new Lloyds headquarters in London, which again, you've got these ideas of legibility, you can read the bits of the building, and of flexibility. The whole notion of this plan, what I think is most interesting about the Lloyds building, is the plan. It was a very strange shaped site, and they used the leftover space of the site to put all the cores to the outside of the building, something which, you know, traditionally the cores are all in the middle of the building, which allowed them to create infinitely flexible floor plates, which became trading floors, this is kind of the birth of the trading floor, around this great atrium space in the middle, which was not what office buildings looked like at this point and was quite kind of groundbreaking. The city, Richard has always had a preoccupation with the city and with urbanism, whether it's through influencing it academically and studies like this, this is what London could be, the embankment of the River Thames if there weren't cars hurtling down the side of it, rather nicer. Um, also through his politics, his involvement with the Urban Renaissance and the Labour Party and the GLA in shaping the way that London has grown. But also in, to be honest, shaping the skyline, you know, over the last three decades, there's one or two of our buildings that have appeared there, and some other equally shapely ones that aren't ours. Um, part of a kind of an amazing changing city. As the practice moved on and sort of into the next generation, if you like, these are, this is very much the, the time when uh, Ivan and Graham were sort of finding their feet as project architects in the practice. There's an early, relatively early, Ivan project in um, Bordeaux, and again, you can see the legibility. You can read each of those law courts, the pods that sit. It's a yeah, law courts building. Each, each court is visible and identifiable. It's in a historic part of the city, and it had to find a way of talking to the historic context, which 
the relationship which is less clear on this side, but there is a um, part of the building that links onto the old historic wall. And as the sort of agendas are changing, looking also at sustainability in architecture, and beginning to look at how our buildings could respond to a need for more sustainable design and be naturally ventilated and not rely on mechanical systems. Themes that, in Ivan's case, he continued to explore in the National Assembly for Wales. This is a project that, this is the competition board, the main competition board. Absolutely stunning project at competition, the idea of a public realm that wrapped up and over the building and was all about the public walking over the nature of Parliament and the democracy of that and being able to look down into the debating chamber. Um, and the debating chamber itself is a huge wind cow that draws the natural ventilation through the building. Sadly, 9-11 changed the nature of this building a lot because this idea of access to the Parliament and the sort of freedom flowing of people, suddenly we had bomb-proof glass all the way around it, which sort of changed the nature of the project a bit. And then here, Graham in the same period of time, and you can see there is quite a difference between Graham and Ivan's architecture. Uh, it's a, a common themes, but a very different approach and a sort of different aesthetic that comes out of that. This is more of the kind of what's become known as the, you know, the image of high tech. But in itself, it, it still has this preoccupation with these themes and with the city too. And in the building on the right, which is the Lloyd's Registry of Shipping, it's an incredibly tight space, site. But even within that, as you approach the building, there's this kind of rather wonderful surprise courtyard. So that even in the tightest sites, we're still are trying to do something that is about more than the building, or creating a, a little piece of public realm. And most recently, of course, Leadenhall Tower, now very nearly complete. Um, this is Graham Stirk again. And here you can see, this is all about the city, this building, because the shape of it is to do with stepping back to keep out of the viewing corridor to St Paul's Cathedral and in the sort of classic view of it you see St Paul's appears as the building leans back and it's very much the structure is very clearly expressed the served and servant principle which I seem to recall being talked about a lot when I was at college here um, all the served space and the servant being the, the, the north core where all the lifting and all the toilet pods and everything happen all very much expressed as the spine of the building serving the floor plates and public realm, again, even though this is a commercial office building, it's got an eight-storey high public space at the base of it, which in that dense part of the city is a kind of huge and dramatic gesture. It's quite an exciting space that frames a church that was opposite the site. And the team, the sixth one of those, that's the colourful uh, RSHP team. Um, but it's more than just our team. Of course, it's the team of people in the office, but much more than that, it's the engineers, the um, M&E guys, the, everyone that we work with, the landscape architects that make our projects what they are. They're, our projects are very much um, a case of where the sum is worth more than the parts, and it's, we are dependent entirely on these amazing people that we get to work with. The nature of our architecture relies so heavily on engineers and, and groundbreaking thinking in terms of uh, sustainable design as well. So... Um, because we have the reputation we have, we are able to work with some amazing people, which is, you know, we don't forget that. Not everyone gets those opportunities. So that's by way of a sort of long-winded introduction. Um, I was going to talk about Mossbourne, which was one of the first city academies, part of the, the Labour Academy programme, and became a bit of a, a kind of a Labour thing. They launched their education policy from the Sports Hall, which is the big yellow block on the right-hand side there. And because this school has been incredibly successful and is now sending several, some between 10 and 20 kids off to Oxbridge every year. And it's in Hackney, which is a fairly deprived part of East London, a lot less deprived now than it was when we built this building. Um, it's definitely been gentrified. But it was a, an amazing project for me personally. I was only what, three years out of college. And it was a very small project by Roger's standards. It was 20 million which was considered a very small project, and therefore had a very small team of it, of people on it. Uh, there were, for the majority of the project, there were only three or four of us, um, which was, it was definitely a sink or swim situation. By the end of the project, everyone had left, apart from me. Um, <laughs> so I was very much last man standing on this job. And I was saying over lunch, I still get phone calls from the school caretaker. We completed this ten years ago. 
and he still rings me when he's having a problem with something. I feel like it's the project that it was a baptism of fire and it's never going to go away. <laughs> so that was the original site. That was a school, that, uh, the Hackney Downs School, which had failed and had been closed. Before it closed, the kids set fire to it. Um, <laughs> which actually they might have been doing a favour. Uh, it wasn't the most beautiful of buildings by any means. And a very difficult site, very landlocked site, very tight site with two railway tracks. Um, has three sides, I'll show you in here. Railway tracks on two of them. But the great benefit of it is the third side was the Hackney Downs, which in that very dense part of London was one of the few kind of quality big green spaces. So in terms of a strategy, it was all about the Downs. So the, the idea is that we would turn our back on the two railway tracks that flanked either side of the site and address everything to a sort of inner heart, which would be the sort of playground courtyard, and then beyond that to the downs with these fantastic mature trees that, which line the front of the site. They're actually on the site, those. Absolutely beautiful. Not shown in the best light here, obviously, in winter. In terms of the client and the setup of the project... Uh, we were very lucky because Michael Wilshaw, who is now well known for being the head of Ofsted, at the time he was one of these super heads and he'd been brought in to start this school from scratch. And he was available during, or he was already on board by the time we were appointed. So we were able to work with the guy who was actually going to be running the school, which was fantastic. And a very uh, sponsor, the Academy's project used to work in such a way that a sponsor paid effectively design fees for the project, not the capital costs but the design fees, and that meant they could choose the architect. That's long gone, and it's now run by contractors. But back then, uh, Clive Bourne, as in Moss Bourne, it's named after his father, uh, was our client representative, effectively. So we had an amazing, enlightened client, and Michael has an incredibly strong view about how the school would be run. And he wanted the design to encapsulate that, to facilitate it, but we also had to bear in mind that Michael might not run that school forever. And so it had to have enough flexibility to change if the way in which the school was being run changed. But the idea was that he felt that the best the way you get the best out of schools was that he wanted to create a series of houses in the sense of not in a public school sense, but in a sense of he wanted to give autonomy and responsibility to the core curriculum areas. So there's a year seven, maths, English, dance and drama and ICT. And each one of these would have their own house, effectively. And the idea was that the school is made up of a number of these houses along a street, albeit in our case a street that bends into a U, and that students would go to their house for the lesson in that subject and then move between houses, which is very different from the way that most schools are set up. And it meant that in terms of the section, this is a sort of notional section, it's only a three-storey building, um, that you get... It turns us back to the railway, so there's a completely solid wall running all the way around the back edge of the, the building, against which we created a top-lit um, resource space, kind of what would have been a library, I think, when I was at school, but a kind of computer resource space. And then you enter, you move between these houses through a cloister, which is the sort of set back ground floor that you can see there. You enter the building at the ground floor of the house. You circulate up in the cores that separate the houses, and then there were two teaching spaces on the first and second floor, which look out to the playground and to the downs beyond, but are accessed from galleried walkways, which run past these triple height resource spaces. So in effect, you've removed any corridors. The school has no corridors. And this was the, one of the overriding theories behind it, that the trouble that you get in schools with discipline and with bullying tends to happen in corridors and in toilets. Um, and dark corners where no one's watching. And so Michael's view was that if you make everywhere is naturally under surveillance by everybody, you avoid those issues. And he appears to be right, because the school's got an amazing um, track record. So this was a very early model, but you can see that there's this massive, a lot of people say Ikea wall, unfortunately coloured perhaps, blue wall that wraps all the way around the back of the site with the railway tracks. That's the Stansted Express line, so you see this when you go to Stansted Airport and then the other railway line on the other side. The downs on the right-hand side there, and the building wrapping round. The other thing you'll notice is it has these towers. Between each of the houses, the stair cores, which provided the vertical circulation, are each topped with a, um, a wind tower, which have... It's a bit like the wind cowl of the Welsh Assembly, 
they have slatted sides, and so the natural movement of air draws the air up through the building, which is then promotes the natural ventilation through the facade, across the floor slab, and up into these resource spaces and out. So it's got a quite a powerful exaggeration of the natural stack effect. And in the top of these wind towers are fans, which can be turned on to drive that stack effect harder in extreme conditions in, in the height of summer. And it's, it's been overall quite successful. Looking at the plan, you can see it's very, very, very simple. You've got these series of cores between which are the triple height resource spaces. I haven't got anything to point to with, but I should. So these are the cores. That would be a house from there to there. Teaching spaces, triple height resource space, a corridor, which isn't a corridor, the gallery. And then each one of these has a wind tower on top. And there are two special spaces, if you like. At the, at the fulcrum of the V is an auditorium space. And at the far end is a large multi-space sports hall and a, a space big enough to do exams in and to bring the whole school together. So that was the old school. It was knocked down and it was crushed up. And we reused the old school to make the foundations. It was crushed on site and it was used uh, as the hardcore and make the foundations of the new building, which you can see here, that's how close the railway track is there to the edge of the site. Um, you can see this, the shape of the building starting to take place. And it's a timber frame. It's a glue lamb timber frame. At the time, it was the biggest one in the UK. I'm sure they're bigger now. But what was amazing about it was it was a bit like Meccano. The way that it was built, they brought the bits. The bits were all worked out well in advance, made in a factory in Holland, shipped over on big trucks, laid out with numbers on the ends of them on the site, and laid down eight frames and put together on the ground and lifted into place. And it went up incredibly fast. There was a point where they were doing a sort of bay a day. It was sort of beautiful. And that's where you see the two wings coming together in the space that was to become the auditorium. See how quickly it went up. And you can see there the H frame lying on the ground waiting to be lifted. And a relatively small kind of site, really, um, in terms of site logistics. So this just gives you an idea of some of the the aspiration and, and, and where that went. So that was the idea of the cloisters. And these, are genu and these aren't retrospective sketches. These are genuinely from the mood boards at the beginning of the process. Um, and that's the, the cloister now. So that's year sevens entering their year seven house. This was the idea of the resource spaces with these galleries um, and the teaching spaces where you can see the numbers, one, two, and three. That's the, it's harder to photograph than it is to draw. Um, that's the base of one of these triple height resource spaces. The colour panels are acoustic um, damping. And those are the walkways that run between them. So this is what replaces a traditional corridor. And you can see that the structure, you know, coming back to these themes of legibility and flexibility, the structure, you can see absolutely how that's gone together. You can see what sits on what. There's a primary frame going this way. There are secondaries that sit on it. There's a floor slab that sits on that. And between those are partitions and glazing. And you, know, you can see the bolts. The idea that, in flexibility terms, this sort of subdivided bay, the 1.2 grid of the beams, that's the planning grid, and the walls can be moved between the classrooms to clip into any one of those, effectively. Which, at the time, I thought, yeah, that'll never happen. But within a year or two of the school opening, they were already under pressure to take bigger class sizes, and they did, on two floors and one side of the building, move the classroom walls and make all the... They lost one classroom and made... Four into, five into four. Made them bigger, and it was a relatively easy job to do. So it did work. It is flexible. Since, since we did this project, it's been massively extended. It's got a sixth form college built onto it. Another sort of five bays were built onto it. It's, it's almost unrecognisable now <laughs> as the building it was back then. The classrooms, which address the courtyard, the central space, and the downs beyond. And again, you've got the it's quite simple materials. You've got an exposed <laughs> soffit with these um, perforated metal, colourful baffles hanging to again absorb sound, and the exposed timber, and then sort of relatively cheap and cheerful cladding. This is the auditorium space. The one nice thing about the school before it was burnt down um, was it had this quite dramatic auditorium space. And even in the sort of modern 60s concrete thing that you saw a picture of, part of this had been kept. But obviously it went when they burnt it down. So the auditorium space that we were trying to create at the sort of fulcrum of this V was in part in reference to that. 
That was before the suits were fitted, but it gives you an idea. And the facade, which was very much built up of these layers, so we couldn't afford a lot of posh solar uh, louvers, but the nature of the facade being set back from the frame, so there are walkways that act as the fire strategy. All the classrooms open out onto these external walkways. In the case of fire, they all pile down into the playground. That created a depth in the facade that naturally shaded the glass. And that's the team. That's Michael Wilshire on the left, Clive Bourne, the sponsor, and Richard, of course. And I think this, for me, was very much one of those projects where you felt... You know, we always say our best projects come from the best relationships with clients and with the users and, if possible, with the contractors. But this really was a case where this project would not have looked or been anything like this without the input of these two men. And it was quite... It felt quite a special project to be involved with in that regard. So, that was Mossbourne. A bit later on, so I spent two years on... Two or three years on Mossbourne. Um, we built it in 18 months, which was pretty quick and I think partly because of the way that the frame went up. This, by contrast, is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, in my experience, anyway. I was on this project for five years. It's 140 million, so a great deal bigger. And instead of being a newbie out of college who didn't know what I was doing, I was the project architect who didn't know what I was doing. Um, so it's still, still slightly a trial by fire, but I enjoyed this one a great deal more. Even though in many ways it's a less poetic project, uh, it was a, an amazing experience building something in this fantastic setting on the banks of the Thames in London. So the site, that's the, for those of you who know London, that's the Tate Modern Art Gallery in the old power station, and the Millennium Bridge, the famous bridge that does or doesn't wobble, um, on axis with the Tower of the Tate. And our site is a bit coloured in in red, so it's very much a leftover site. It was a bunch of warehouses. This part of Southwark has been massively regenerated and now is, you know, super shishi and styly. At this point, it was on its way, but it wasn't there yet. There still were kind of hinterlands of uh, warehouses. And the site, I'll show you in the, the plan, it's a very strange shape. It's very much a kind of leftover site. Um, the bluefin development had happened to the right, and the Tate, the regeneration of the Tate, and there was a sort of funny triangle that was left that we were meant to put... Um, not far off 200 flats on. So looking at the site, the usual site analysis, site response, all the stuff that you do at college, we still do. This is a kind of classic site analysis, looking at the constraints and trying to find a way through how we were going to resolve the very strange geometry. The location of these almshouses, where the number one is, these are two-storey high, listed, beautiful almshouses. And then on the right, where the sun is sat, is the bluefin development, which is about 20 storeys high. So our site had a two-storey high building on one side and a 20-storey high building on the other. And how you mitigate that change in scale and find some kind of harmony in this strange geometry. So the approach was to wrap the project, if you like, around, wrap the mass of the project around the sides of the site to keep it away from these rather vulnerable almshouses. And it was very important to us that the public, that this didn't act as a block between the hinterland of Southwark and the river. So these two north-south routes were created that we were determined would remain public through what's effectively a private residential scheme. And these two routes are, in my mind, the success of the project. <coughs> we then divided, so you create those two routes, which slices up the mass a bit. We then started to slice it up into pavilions, which were effectively about allowing views out and allowing permeability through the site, movement through the site, which led us to four pavilions, all pretty much the same, and a fifth building, which you wouldn't even notice on here, but is effectively it's a gatehouse, which is this building here, which serves the purpose of ending this terrace on Southwark Street. This is a kind of classic Southwark Street um, uh, sort of industrial architecture, rather lovely, and we needed to find a way of transitioning from that around the corner into our scheme. And that was the role given to that building, which was for ages called the Gatehouse, and is now glamorously Pavilion E. So that was the project, this, this position of the pavilions. It allows sun in and it allows views out, because obviously it's a um, residential developer. They want to maximise views as much as possible, views to the river. 
that's what sells. So we're trying to create a geometry that also allows maximum views to the river, but also looking back made the most of the views looking back to across the city. So that was sort of the, you see it in the context there of the arms houses and Tate. The, probably as big an issue was how we would deal with this change in scale, stepping up from these really teeny tiny little things up against the bluefin and higher. And so the buildings are pavilions that step up, because pavilion I've ever seen, but they're called pavilions, um, that step up in six-storey lifts. So it goes 12, 18, 24, then drops back down to 12, and finally back down to six for the gatehouse, which is this one here, which is more of a scale of the Southwark Street Terrace. So that's the kind of the party sketch, the thing that the client now has on his wall, a little uh, sketch of what we were going to try and do. Sun's in the wrong place. Um, we made early models to look at the massing and the relationship of these buildings to each other and to the surroundings. And you can see here, these are the routes that come through between the buildings. This are these north-south routes that connect through to the landscaped area next to the Tate and the ramp that runs down into the Tate. And so these routes were always very important in the project. They were key... We sold them very strongly because it's this element of public realm again and of the city in the context of being more than just some posh flats. Um, and we made it a big sell in the planning, so the planners were very behind it, which helped us hang on to them. And they are, that was the sort of the aspiration for them, and we modelled how we thought they would look. They would basically be roots that were defined by these raised groves of planting. So you walked along next to a mounded grove of planting that separated the public walking from the private entrances to the building. So you would step, you'd walk across the grove, and that was meant to suggest an element of privacy so that people didn't stray into the building. So rather than having fences and gates, we were trying to naturally control people movement. And this is, the grove is actually, the bit you walk on is actually on the right of this line of trees. This is the residence garden. But to my mind, the setting and the landscape and these routes have, have really made a lot of what the success of the project. I'll show some more finished pictures in a minute. So you see here the arrangement. You've got the four pavilions, the fifth slightly strange-shaped pavilion. The buildings themselves, relatively simple. The idea was to try and create flexible space that could be configured in many different ways uh, so the developer could have all sorts of different flat arrangements on different floors, but which would have a unified appearance outside. Again, the serve and servant nature. You've got the cores to the right-hand side there with two lifts sticking out of the building. And there's effectively two pieces, two structures going on. There's the concrete frame, the gravity structure, which holds the building up. But in order to avoid that getting too big or having to use shear walls, which then fix the plan in a sense because there's no moving shear walls or getting around them, we dealt with the lateral movement, the wind loading of the building, as an external brace structure. And that enabled us to keep the structure that sits within the building rather leaner. So you can see here the idea of the served and the servant space. It's a very the diagram on the right there. It's a very efficient floor plate. It's a relatively small core to the amount of uh, residential floor plate that you're getting and very short travel distances to the flats. And this diagrid, the system that um, someone in the office described it as a uh, fishnet stockings, wasn't quite the way we saw it, but this kind of grid that wraps around the building which deals with all the wind loading. And that also hangs the winter gardens so at the apex of each end of the building are these triangular spaces. And the idea behind that was that they would not be part of the thermal line of the building. They would be single glazed winter garden spaces. By being single glazed, they become far more transparent and therefore reduces the mass of the building that you look at the, as you look at it because you do actually, it breaks down the ends. You see through them much more than you do the rest of the glazing. So you've got the diagrid bracing, wrapping around the building and from that are hung the winter garden structures, which are the red steels that you see on the right. So the bracing is serving two purposes. It's dealing with the wind load and it's hanging the winter gardens. And you can see here, these are the winter gardens I'm talking about. So this part of the building is single glazed. The thermal line is from that point backwards. And you get a more feathered edge. And you can see the bracing hanging these 
So actually at the bottom, there isn't any support in the last winter garden, which shows very clearly, again, this idea of legibility, that they're all hung. And that shows you the idea that the transparency that you read the building really is to there. And then you get this sort of feathered edge of the winter garden at the end. The top of the buildings um, are the penthouses. And we wanted to use the penthouses as a way of tying the geometry of these buildings together in the way that they stepped. There's an angle that effectively aligns the buildings as they step up. So this is the idea that this, if you were to draw a line through these, that there's a geometry that connects the top of these buildings, even though there's a six-storey difference in each one. And in terms of the facade, they're big buildings, and we were very keen to make sure they didn't look commercial. So we did lots of things with the facade to try and break down the scale and give it a domestic feel. There's a sort of three-storey expressed frame that breaks down the 12, 18 or 24 into bands of three. And then within that, we played games with smaller panels and introducing wood into the cladding, which creates a sort of softness, but also talks to the palette of colours in the area, which tend to be that sort of slightly yellowy brown brick. And the red steelwork is a reference to Blackfriars Bridge, which is just adjacent to the site, which is that red colour. So you can see here a three-storey lift. This is obviously a, an early model, and that's the cladding mock-up, developing the facades and trying to create... One of the great things about the bracing is it created a sort of depth to the facade, that it's, the buildings never seem flat. They're quite dynamic. That was a relatively early model looking at the potential Tate extension and the effect that... Because it was a bit unknown when we started this project what that was going to be. And it changed, as I've been to Moran, changed the scheme a few times. So we were looking at how that would affect the relationship with our building. So we started on site in 2009, I think, um, with Block A, which never buy the first block in a big development. Block A is full of mistakes. Um, block A took a year, and then we sped up, because then we'd worked out a lot about um, what we needed to do. So whilst Block A was being finished, Block B superstructure was coming up. And the, it's a very tight site. I mean, you see how busy that site is. You can't move. And all the stuff is being stored on it as well. The site behind is the Tate site, starting up behind with the big oil drums that are now complete. Mm. So a very congested little corner for two big building projects to be going on simultaneously. Quite quickly, it came out the ground. And there it is, looking across the landscaping. You can see the blocks stepping up and then back down. In the foreground, you just see blocky the small block here, and a pavilion which was added fairly late on in the process to provide a sort of gym pavilion in the garden for the residents. You can see how the early models, it's you know, not a million miles away. That's a bit of detail of the facade, this idea of trying to break up the scale of the facade and create a layering with the bracing and the facade and then the different materials in it. The lifts, of course, classic Rogers lifts, um, expressing the movement. It also, the idea was, you, you know, nice lifts give everyone an opportunity to enjoy the best views across the river. The, the way the lifts are positioned, when you go up in the lift, you see the river, you see the shard. It's an absolutely amazing view from the lift. So even if you've got a small studio flat facing um, in the wrong direction, you still get the dramatic view when you go up in the lift. And one of the amazing things about this project, other than an utterly enlightened client who got that quality um, and, and integrity and actually allowing us to, to do it properly would give him value rather than cutting the cost would make it cheaper. And I mean, they've made a killing on it, so they're a very happy client. Um, but we were given the opportunity to do everything, including the interiors. So this is from the lobbies, which we were able to design right down to that desk, the reception desk, which is also a post desk. Um, the posts for the entry gear, everything, which was a real luxury. We don't sometimes get to see that a lot more than we do. We tend to only do shell and core. This is one of the lobbies where you come out of the lifts approaching the flats. And then the flats themselves, which are very simple. They, a lot of them have been um, interior designed since, but this was how they were when we sort of finished with them, if you like. That's one of those winter gardens. So you can see the thermal line of the building is this, and these are big double glazed bifold doors. This winter garden is single glazed, and these panels open. So in the summer, you can open both sides of it, and it's effectively an enclosed balcony. The penthouse, 
we did the fit out of one of the penthouses and then the client realised that our idea of high-end interior design was not what people who spend this kind of money want. So they got some interior designers to do the rest of them. Um, but we enjoyed this. Uh, beautiful, very calm spaces, amazing views across the river. And a bit of uh, beautiful bathroom design we got to do. Don't expect to get a chance to do that again. <laughs> that one is, but that's the penthouse one. The the smallest flats when we when they started selling them in block A, the smallest sort of one beds were selling at about six hundred thousand. I think you can't get anything cheaper than a million now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, but an amazing experience, an amazing project to work on. So finally, in the last five minutes or so, I'll talk about what I'm currently working on now. This was a competition, you're probably all aware of it, it was in the press quite a lot, for the London School of Economics new Global Centre for Social Science. It was a competition that was stupidly run over the summer when everybody was away. So even though it was nominally a six-week uh, competition or even eight-week competition, in reality we spent about four or five weeks on it, which was an incredibly intense period of time to effectively come up with a fairly well-designed proposal. One thing I can say for sure about this building, so we won the competition, um, is it won't look like this. <laughs> so these are the six competition boards. And really what I was going to say about this is that this is sort of, every now and then we do competitions and it's intense, but it brings you back to some of that fun of college of having a very small period of time to come up with something. And it comes back to relying on those kind of core ideas that generate a response. And in this case, it was a lot to do with looking past the brief. Um, there's a joke in our office that Ivan never reads the brief. This is an Ivan job again, like Mossbourne. Um, Bankside was with, Graham's, uh, with, yeah, with Graham. The brief was for a site that is about sort of that big. Our scheme kind of looked at the LSE campus. And we said that in order to make a meaningful building, you need to look at the campus as a whole, which is utterly disjointed. You can't find your way through it. The, the routes don't go anywhere. It's very hard to identify which buildings are part of the LSE. And so what we decided to do was create a big square in the middle of it. So we gave up a bit like the Pompidou approach. We gave up a large part of the site to create the new LSE square. I really need a pointer for this because I'm going to stand in it, but never mind. This is the new student centre that's just opened, that's been in the architectural press a lot recently. And this is the historically the home of the LSE, the old academic building. And the library is the big building at the top there. And there's a huge student flow north-south up Houghton Street to the library and east-west from the eastern edge of the campus, the LSE Towers, to the student centre and beyond. So this is their building too. And at the moment, there's a building that blocks this and blocks this. So you can't do either of those routes. So we decided to create a square at the heart of those two routes and to open up the scheme so that you could see from the, the um, emotional home, if you like, of the LSE, the old building, right across the campus to the library. And this is the strength of which we won it on. They, when we spoke to them after the competition, they said that they loved this kind of bigger picture, looking past the brief and creating a much bolder plan the building themselves, itself, they could sort of, the things about it they weren't so keen on, but they felt that they could work with us. And I think with competitions, so often that's what you're doing. You're, you're setting an approach and a team that will work together, not necessarily the solution that we're all going to see built. So the building itself, the idea was that this is the new square that's been created. So we chopped down this building, this, a slice of this building off and created a new core on the end of it, addressing the square, and created a building that has a front door and a new address for the LSE on this square, and a kind of big vertical circulation spine addressing that square. The building itself, and it was funny going around the, the new Stephen Hall building, because there are some similar issues about trying to create a building that is effectively two rectilinear pieces of accommodation with a shared sort of atrium space that you're trying to create uh, informal mixing between staff and students. One of the things in the LSE brief 
was they felt that their staff-student relationship had become, or academics and student relationship had become far too hierarchical. The academics like to sit in their offices and do their thing and just see the students when they have to. And actually they wanted to mix it up much more and create spaces where they would interact more naturally and less formally. So the idea of the scheme was that we'd create this sort of central atrium space, which was, I think Ivan described it as a bumping space, full of kind of breakout study <coughs> pods, study areas, informal performance spaces, the stuff of competitions. Um, and that we but there's a very clear zoning strategy of the building, which is to do with creating the most public elements at the ground floor with the, the refectory, catering, restaurants, sandwiched above and below it are the main teaching spaces. So you're dealing with the highest volumes of movement at the bottom of the building. And above that, you move into the academic departments and professional services provision. And that we wanted to celebrate the movement of these large numbers of people down into the, the lecture theatres uh, and through this kind of generous staircase that flows through the public spaces. I think you can see that there. So that's the new public square with the big lecture theatre under it. These are other teaching spaces grouped around the base of the atrium connected by this quite sort of flowing circulation. And that's the public part of the building. This circulation stops at this floor and the floors above are served by the vertical circulation. This is the lower building, which relates to Houghton Street, which is six storeys. And the foreground is the big part of the building, which is the 12-storey bit that relates to the scale of the LSE towers and the taller buildings on the site. You can see the sort of the pods and the, the projections. The idea was that these were pieces of furniture. You can see the sort of little diagrams on the right. That these were pieces of furniture that the LSE could almost choose what they want. They could have two pods and you know five benches and two performance spaces. And they were almost kind of clipped into the atrium space to encourage this dynamic flow. In plan terms, and the lower parts of the building, you end up with... Um, effectively two, these are the two buildings which the lower part are, are linked and then as you go higher up the building this drops away as a terrace and you just have the taller part of the building which rises up for another six storeys but that the circulation and these two buildings are sort of joined as a, an axis here so you come up and you enter the two parts of the building and then when that drops away it remains the vertical circulation for the taller building another view of that atrium space and of course, working with BDSP, um, who we also work with on the Welsh Assembly, there's an aspiration for it to be BRIAM outstanding. It's entirely, the proposal is that it's entirely naturally ventilated and that this atrium space helps drive that, a bit like some of the other buildings I've talked about, helps drive that natural stack effect. And that that enables us to give the people who work in the building control over their environment so they have openable windows and blinds that they can pull down, as opposed to a building that's controlled by a building management system that they have no interface with. So that's the, uh, the aspiration. As I say, the one thing... Ooh, hang on, I'll go back one. Um, the one thing that you can be certain of is that it won't look like that. The, in terms of the expression of the building, they felt... Uh, in the interview, I did the interview. Ivan was in Australia when we came to the final interview, and it was probably the toughest interview I've ever done. Um, partly because it was a panel of 16, most of whom had professor in their title, and they had a lot of views on the kind of the nature of architecture. I mean, they're a brilliant client because they're prepared to debate these things and discuss them. It's not all driven by money, but it also is pretty tough grilling in an interview situation. And one of the questions was, uh, this appears to be an RSHP building. What makes it the LSE's building? And I think that's the process we're now starting we're sort of unpicking a lot of the assumptions that we made for five weeks at a competition um, and trying to get to know the LSE and understand much more how this building would actually work and what the right expression of the nature of the LSE is, which is probably not this. This was more to do with solar shading and um, uh, flexible space and a system-built frame, all the kind of preoccupations we have, which we now need to layer with the preoccupations of the client. And I say it's, it's through that relationship that we, we have our core principles that we're building on, but we need to enrich those with an understanding of the specifics of the client and, and the brief. So that's what's coming next. It'll be finished in 2018.
Does anybody have one? Why is legibility important? Well, I don't think it has to be. Uh, to us it's important because we think that it's nice to be able to look at a building and understand the way that it's put together, that everything in it is not just an expression of the way that it's put together, but it's genuinely... When you look at a piece of a building, you can usually see what it's doing and understand that it is doing just that. So it's not there. It's a different, there are other architectures which are more to do with image making or to do with creating um, a more sculptural, more um, artisan, if you like, approach. This is a kind of systems approach to it. And rather, we go through a process when we're designing which is very much stripping down, you know, what does that piece of structure need to do? You know, for example, at the moment we're looking at whether the, uh, the columns or the wind posts are actually an expression of the, the moment going through it. It's, it's a tool that we use, if you like, but it's one which we think has a kind of integrity to it because it means that you're building what needs to be there, not just your view of what it should be. It's one way. I'm the one who has to read the brief for Ivan. <laughs> well, um, we, uh, we had a party, a Christmas party last year. Uh, this Christmas just gone, and the scene for it was kind of 1920s, and it was meant to be um, flappers and gangsters. And uh, Ivan turned up looking like something from Run DMC. <laughs> and they were all just going, that's so Ivan. <laughs> gangstar, as opposed to gangster. So he had his kind of his chains and his DMC and his baseball cap on backwards. <laughs> Um, it, I think he does it intentionally. He's kind of the free spirit mm -hmm. in a system where there are plenty of people analysing and looking at what needs to be there. And then he, his particular thing is the creative process is sort of slightly butting into that. Yeah. And so, if you like, a bit going against what you're saying, that he said, well, does it have to be like that? Could it be something different? Mm -hmm. Which is it's very different from the way Graham works, but it, it's, it's got its own kind of um, architecture that flows from that. Uh, I have a question. How do buildings of, of your practice uh, stand over time? Or how do you um, protect the exposed uh, legibility from deterioration? Well, I guess time will tell, because we haven't had a chance to get that old. I mean, Lloyd's, was, Lloyd's London was recently listed, and um, that's been part of the reason that services are on the outside of that was to do with the discussion about replacement, that these things will become outdated and be replaced. And I think there was an expectation that a lot of those pods themselves would be replaced, and that hasn't been the case, and some of the kit inside them has, but the, the building itself seems to have pretty much stood up pretty well to it. But I guess our oldest buildings are only 30 years old, so perhaps we have to wait another 20 years to, to really know. But so far, they, they seem to be looking pretty good. I think only one thing pulled down. Um, we had a little college building at Thames Valley University that was pulled down, but it was because the site was being redeveloped, not because it was just in bad nick. did try. I mean, One High Park is probably our most controversial project because it seems to fly in the face of all that Richard says about social housing. I mean, interestingly, <coughs> it's, it's well and truly the highest social housing for any project built in um, Kensington and Westminster, although very few people know that or want to know that. Um, most pro projects in Kensington and Westminster have about 15% affordable housing. That has 40%. It's not on the site, but it's on very nice areas in other parts of the borough and it's appropriate housing so it's family units and stuff which that wouldn't be appropriate in those massive floor plates. I think there are issues. I don't think we'd do a one high park again to be honest. I think what it was changed over the nature of the project. It was always going to be high end housing but I think the kind of candy and candy phenomena 
took off during the period of that project. And I don't think any of us envisaged that they would be selling for the kind of crazy money um, that they did. And the really sad thing is there's almost no one in them. It's kind of an empty building. I don't know, Richard's been talking about this in the press. Um, and it's difficult because when you start on a project, you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. And it was also happening at a time when you know there was the recession, and it was you know the by the time we were in it, it was difficult to walk away from it. Um, but I think there are definitely issues, and it's been the subject of so much debate in our office. So it, it's not something that the office kind of took lightly. There's a, a legacy that's come from that. And um, quite often we have these sessions on a Monday morning when we look at potential jobs and we discuss things that are coming in and whether we should do them or not. And it's quite often that we'll get a, uh-uh, it's a one-high car. Um, you know, so let's not go there again. I think it's a, personally, I really like the scheme, architecturally, I think it's quite impressive, but I think what it stands for is, is not so good. <laughs> We've got, I think, 15 people in Australia and three in China. But the rest of the people are in our office in Thames Wharf. And uh, we discuss absolutely, I know I, it would bore you all, but I could probably list the jobs that we're doing. Um, most people, the senior partners have a kind of overview. Graham and Ivan, either Graham or Ivan, tend to lead each of the projects. But I think people think we build an awful lot more than we do. At any one given time, the number of projects we have that are being built is three or four. Um, obviously there are lots that are kind of starting and incubating and may or may not come onto anything. Um, but it isn't that overwhelming. And we do consider very carefully the work that we take. And we are lucky that we, we're in a position at the moment where we're able to be reasonably selective about what we do. So I personally have only, I'm only involved in one job. I do a lot of stuff that's beyond the architecture too with the, the office and um, recruitment and resourcing and things like that. But in terms of the project, I'm only on one at a time. So I spent five years on Bankside, and I suspect I'll spend the next five years on the other two. Um, so it's only really the kind of items and grams that are spread across numerous projects. We're quite a, hmm, I think we're quite a, a fat office in the sense that we, we have a very high ratio of support staff to architects which enables, we have departments that do things like drawing control, drawing issues, model making, graphics, brochure production, chess, all sorts of things that kind of allow the architects, <laughs> kind of, that's really good that, yeah, um, that allow the architects to really do the architecture, the culture and the architecture. And that is quite a luxury, I think, that you don't really get in, in a lot of practices. So perhaps that's partly why you don't have to spread so thin. So another architect, about three other architects at various RIV stages had a pop at it. Uh, then Mossbourne got a new site in the building second academy. They wanted us to do it. We're not allowed to. Um, they've tried and tried and tried to buck that trend. And now they've got a primary school, and again, they're trying to get us involved. But unfortunately, the, the system has moved now to a point where, especially with school design, it's almost entirely contractor-led. And the contractor wants to work with architects who are very definitely not us. They, they, they don't, well, we are their worst nightmare because we won't just roll over and do it the way the contractor wants. And so I think it is, the way that we approach it is by making a lot of noise about it and a lot of fuss about it and going to these interviews and you know, kind of making ourselves unpopular and not getting the jobs. Um, but, and it helps that Richard has a kind of political profile and he done, we did a huge amount of work trying to work with the Labour Party and they were in power, their education, 
department and then since a bit of Michael Gove but less successfully in trying to influence <laughs> you know, the role of architects in because you get all this stuff written about you know Moscow and you have the two extremes you have one that it's just giving architects too much money and why does it matter anyway but then you have people like um, Michael Wilshaw who utterly believes that the architect has helped him create a school where he doesn't have brilliance where students are able to pay attention in classes and you know, that the school has performed in part, not entirely, but in part as a response to the architecture. So there's definitely a very polarised school of thought on it, and we're just trying to make a lot of noise and trying to... There's been a lot of articles in the press, and I don't mean the architecture press, and the mainstream press, written by um, either Richard or actually Ivan or I, um, on these subjects, trying to kind of keep the debate out there. But I don't know, contractors are powerful and it's a way of government getting a single point of responsibility that architects aren't in a position to take. It seems that a lot of practices are priced out by taking their systems and um, yeah. the construction based approach. Is that something that Yeah we're doing that too. Um, more so in housing. We've got you know, the, we call it the sixty pound house but um, I've got nicknamed that there's currently one a prototype down in Wimbledon but it's called YQ which is basically this is about the thirty thousand pound house. These are sort of um, flat pack system built houses that can be assembled very quickly, very affordable, and we've done a prototype scheme of Milton Keynes and there's a sort of little corner of the office that's a plug in away. And it seems to be taking off. We've just got planning permission for a scheme in Newham and there's two more schemes in the pipeline which are looking at trying to use exactly that kind of kit apart housing. We've tried to move that system over, we did a bid for the Hackney Preschool. And we tried to um, take that system across. It was relatively a six-story building. It was something we could have done using the same component parts. And because it was a contractor-led process, we thought, well, if we can control what it is that we're building with, then maybe that would work. But the contractor didn't want anything to do with us. And, um, didn't work. So yeah, that's absolutely true. That is, and I think there's, that's going to increasingly become the way in housing and in schools. Do you think if a high-tech practice started today, do you think they have similar success and luxury in terms of the office structures you or does the profile of Richard himself have quite a big impact on that? What do you think? Ah, it's a bit of crystal ball gazing. Um, I think, no, I don't think that practices like this will be starting in the same way. I think this is, we are at the tail end of something that was born out of its time. And I think practices will be different now. I think that high-tech architecture per se is sort of less acceptable. There has to be a bit more layered. It has to be more thought through than just high-tech for the sake of high-tech. The sustainability side of it alone, you know, we can't build all glass buildings anymore. It's just, it's, it's not acceptable. Um, so I think we are having to look quite, and that's part of the evolution of the practice, I think, is uh, that we're having to look at the way that we work and the way we design. And I'm not sure that, you know, there's that programme, the Brits who built modern architecture, modern Britain or something. You know, that was a moment in time with those guys who have gone on to, were a great influence at the time. I suspect the next big influence in architecture will be something different. I don't think it would be that again. Thank you very much. Before I pass the vote of thanks to, to Nick, um, that is the, the last lecture of the term and series. So hopefully we've seen a range of what following studying architecture can lead to, whether it's writing about architecture, whether it's directly practicing, practicing with education, doing a Neil Spiller and drawing stuff that none of us understand, but it looks great. <laughs> um, and not all of us will become architects, but hopefully, we've, as I said, we've seen a range of what, what we can do with the skills that we're learning here. So that's the end, and Nick, for a bit of thanks.